I love performing and I love telling stories and I love making an audience feel something. And so whenever I pick roles, it's always in that pursuit. If I read something that's particularly inspiring or compelling, I chase it. If I get it, it just means that I was the right guy for it. And if I don't, then I just move on to the next one. Hi, Vanity Fair. I'm Seth Green, and this is the timeline of my career. What was the bear's name? State of Maine. Mm-hmm. The bear was on his last legs. But they were the only legs he had. I got the Hotel New Hampshire by auditioning. I was eight years old and auditioned in New York City. I had been working for over a year living in Philadelphia and taking the trains uh, back and forth to New York for auditions. This was the first feature film that I got and I was thrilled, thrilled to get it. I actually don't remember the original audition, but I remember the follow-up where my mom came into the room with me and spoke with the director and the casting agent and they told her that they wanted me to play this part. And when we left that room, we skipped down the stairs. It was the most exciting thing ever. Hey bro, I'm only kidding. I mean, who could beat a night of cards, chips, dips, and dorks? <laughs> I was maybe 13. I might have turned 14 while working on Camp I Me Love. The reason that, that that particular project was so significant was it marked a change in the way my mom tried to prepare me for auditions. When I went to audition for it, I had already memorized my lines. And so in the waiting room, I was kind of playing around or hanging out with other kids that I knew. And my mom saw other kids sitting in chairs, dutifully going over their sides with their parent. And she felt a little irresponsible and tried to say, well, we should be going over our lines. And I was like, I'm, I'm fine, I'm actually, I've already done all my prep and I'm ready to go in the room. And so when I got that job, it changed the way my mom thought about it. And she realized that we didn't have to do what everybody else was doing just because they were doing it. Each person's process was gonna be their own process. And from that point on, she kind of just let me uh, approach the work by my own design. Something stinks in suburbia. Hi. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. What you looking at? This cheerleading trophy. It's like its eyes follow you wherever you go. I like it. Well, I've really spent my whole career playing uh, guest stars or, you know, uh, coming in in a recurring way. And that's, that's a position I love. That's something very comfortable for me. And so I didn't look at coming onto Buffy as something scary. Um, it was really exciting. It was a great way to come into something that was already well-functioning and play a part that, that seemed really organic to me. And, and to get to do things I hadn't gotten to do on, on film very often, like play guitar or kiss a girl. But I knew both Sarah Geller and Allison Hannigan from having worked with them when we were much younger. And then when I got to audition for it, it was as Ali's potential boyfriend. And since we'd already worked together a bunch of times, I thought, oh, this would be great. She's fantastic to work with. And I'll bet we could play a pretty convincing couple. But actually getting to make that show over a couple of seasons and really develop that character into something, that was a thrill. I love Oz um, and I'm so grateful for the chance to have gotten to play it. You're trying to make your friend Xander jealous or even the score or something. And that's on the empty side. It seems the tables have turned again, Dr. Evil. Not really. Kill the little bastard, see what I care. But dad, we just had a breakthrough in group. I had the group liquidated, you little shit. They were insolent. I hate you. I hate you. I wish I was never artificially created in a lab. I was working on a play in San Diego. And so I was very serious about acting when I got that comedy project. And my take on it was that Scott Evil is in a drama while everyone around him is in a ridiculous comedy. I've been seeing so many angry, violent, or outrageous teenagers on things like Jerry Springer, and they all seemed victim of the same kind of parental apathy. That, to me, was very funny to explore. When you have a character that is as bold and as silly as Dr. Evil, who is trying as sincerely as he can to form a relationship with his teenage son, the notion of that teenage son being legitimately angry or hurt <laughs> by the lack of uh, participation in his own upbringing, that, that just 
that struck me very funny. And so that was how I approached it. Instead of being a kid who's like, I hate my dad, my dad's a dick. Um, I just thought it was funny to come from a place of legitimate hurt or <laughs> deeply emotional pain um, of trying to grow up and even understand myself as a character with this malevolent dictator as a, as a father. The fun behind the scenes of that movie is incomparable. It, I, I have had so few experiences that are as inclusive and supportive and just fun as making Austin Powers. And what I found was the more serious and more committed I was to the genuine pain of Scott Evil, the funnier any of those scenes became. Because none of those other characters care about my character's feelings. They are all just ridiculous and in pursuit of world domination through whatever idiotic means they're, they're, they're enacting. And so from my perspective, the more realistically I was hurt by it, the funnier any of those scenes became. Why make trillions when we could make billions? A trillion is more than a billion, numbnuts. All right, zip it. You, don't, you can't even- Zip it. Zip. Look, all Ladies I'm... and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit A. <sighs> Yo, Dana. You wanna dance? I'm allergic. Allergic? To dancing? Yeah. I grew up loving John Hughes movies, R-rated teen comedies, or PG-13 teen comedies. And when that script came up, um, I knew the writers uh, personally. My friend Brecken Meyer had originally been cast in the role that I played, Kenny Fisher. Uh, the role was actually written for him, but he got an opportunity to do a different movie, a, a far more high profile drama and couldn't do it. So I, just like everything else, had to audition for this part, but I wanted it so bad. I really loved this script. I loved this idea. And I especially loved this character, this incredibly insecure, character who is full of bravado and outward demonstrations of his lack of fear while he is crippled by his worry of what other people will think of him. And so that's a great place to come from. And I just wanted to bring honesty to that. I wanted him to not just be a fool, but a fool that you could sympathize with. And I wanted to justify all of his fashion choices or conversation choices, all of his intent, I wanted that to be justified under all of this deep sadness and insecurity um, that I think everyone feels when you're teenage. I like playing underdogs and challenging the audience to, to like them. And then I love bringing a humanity to the character that makes people feel empathy for someone who is uh, ridiculous. But Kenny Fisher gets a lot of love and I appreciate that. Why you gotta waste my flavor? Damn! I've never seen this man before in my life. Principal Shepard, what are you doing here? Getting to make Can't Hardly Wait was a thrill just because I got to work with so many people who I knew personally, um, and also getting to meet people who I had admired for some time but never gotten to work with, like Charlie Corsmo. And Charlie and I became really good friends over the course of making that. He came to LA to do the press junket for the movie. Um, he stayed with me in my apartment and we hung out all week going to KFC and reading all of our terrible reviews and highlighting the more severe comparisons between us and some kind of uh, undesirable woodland creature. But while Charlie and I were spending that week together, we just got into this riff of impersonating uh, Ted Levine's character in The Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill. That character who has such a distinct voice and physical persona and such an uncomfortable presence and we set about just applying it to comedy. Like where was Buffalo Bill working? How did Buffalo Bill make money? Is he a telemarketer? Like, is he trying to sell you Amway? What is it that he does? And at one point we started imagining him working the drive-through and you hearing on the squawk box. What, 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 what can I get here? Can I get a, a two-piece meal with uh, mashed potatoes? Oh, uh, you want the two-piece mashed potatoes? Do you want a piece of corn for an extra 50 cents? And that just made us laugh all week. And so when I got the audition for Family Guy, I read that script and I just loved it. It was so funny. I had never felt more seen um, <laughs> than reading that script. And uh, 
I just wanted that job so much. Um, so I went in and they showed me the character. And, you know, if you look at Chris Griffin, he's got the blonde hair and an earring and a hat. And it kind of looks like a surfer kid. And so that was the voice that I had even thought. He was like, what's up, dad? I'm like, fight the machine, dad. Nah. I did it like that. And they were like, okay, great, great, thanks. And I said, hey, can, can, I, can I try something? And as an actor, I always advocate this. If you have something, try it. It's your audition. If you say, oh, I want to start again, do it. It's your audition. Own that space. And so I took a really silly risk and said, my buddy and I have been doing this voice all week and I just feel like it's applicable somewhere. So what if this kid sounded like this? And I did that deeply bassy, grotesquely disturbing uh, performance, but in this animated comedy dialogue. And they said, oh, can you make it a little bit younger? And so I raised the pitch up just slightly, but kept all the same uh, details to it. And then I wound up getting that job, which is bananas. That's insane. But they said the reason that I got it was because I did something so different. And if you really think about it, that's the same reason that I got Austin Powers, was just doing something that nobody else was doing that felt sincere or appropriate. I, I always try and trust that instinct. And I always try and take risks. Because if you do something that they can't unsee, then it was always meant to be you. Could you maybe talk to Marco about him always doing my face? You remember in the what video, I established the face? Well, ever since then, every time you see Marco, he's doing the face and it's mine. You look at him on TRL, hi Carson. You look at him on the Kids' Choice Awards, this is ours, thanks. And then right here on the cover of Seventeen Magazine, hi little girl, beauty secrets. Devin Harry, who wrote and directed Can't Hardly Wait, uh, wrote and directed Josie, and they, after the fact, approached me and Brecken and Donald Faison and Alex Martin about playing the boy band in the movie. It was just gonna be this cameo at the very beginning. And because I had spent the last, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, like watching all of these boy bands evolve, you know, New Kids on the Block or O-Town, the archetypes were so clear that it was really funny to play this super exaggerated version of any of those characters. And whenever you look at those bands, uh, whether it's in sync or uh, Backstreet Boys in the height, in the absolute height of their absurdity. The audience is as big as it's gonna get and they're doing things like arena tours and you know, coming out of the rafters on cables, shooting streamer guns into an audience of 14 year olds. Like the scene that we were doing was us arriving on a tarmac with like thousands of screaming fans and they had gone through the effort of producing all of this physical merchandise with our faces on it in character because that's the best way to make this seem real. There's a thing about acting where everybody knows that they're playing along, but when you're in the scene, you have to really give it as if it's true or the audience doesn't receive it. I became obsessed with this idea of like laying hands on people behind the barrier. <laughs> They're walking down the row and just doing that thing that you see evangelicals do of like putting your hand on somebody's forehead and then pushing them away like, you're healed. And I thought <laughs> that was a really subtle way to demonstrate the godlike certainty that my character had come to understand. Um, <laughs> but I did have a moment during the filming of it. You know, you got like, 300 screaming kids that are all extras that are wearing a shirt with your face on it. When you walk down the row and like shake their hands or sign their shirt or their forehead or whatever it is that you're doing, there was only one guy that like, he was like, ah! And I walked, put my hands on him and I was like, you're loved, you're important. We, in that moment, we just like connected in each other's eye and we both knew it wasn't real. <laughs> we both just <laughs> I got it. I'm gonna get a NAT 770 digital decoder with the 70 watt amps and Burr Brown DACs. Yeah. It's a big stereo. Speakers so loud they blow women's clothes off. Now you choke. <laughs> Italian job was far less um, challenging for me. I was a passenger through most of the things. So aside from having to get certified in scuba and learn how to ride a motorcycle and s some basic stunt driving. I, I didn't have to do anything on film that was that was all that new for me. I was able to speak tech jargon as if it was a natural sentence <laughs> and be a convincing guy in a van. He's on your six. And so this guy was part of this elite, super cool crew. And yet it was me. So what's funny about it is him getting zero respect. 
from every angle. I was like, this guy should have the money to do cool stuff, but just not be able to do it well. Like he reads all the same magazines. He can shop in the same high fashion stores with the money that he's made from these heists, but the jacket doesn't fit him right. Or he bought this expensive bike and he doesn't know how to ride it well. And that, that to me is where the comedy comes in. So you have this guy who can compete with all of these awesome, incredibly cool people who run with guns and spin out cars and punch a guy out. And I, I, the character rolls in that crew, but is not cool like them. So finding that balance for me was, was a blast. Gary Gray let me run. He wanted me to be funny anytime I could. The best is where uh, Jay Statham goes to get the key card from the cable girl. And I had just been imitating Jason. Gary thought it was really funny. He was like, I'm just gonna film that. And so we shot three takes of me running their dialogue and then they just edited them together and into whatever the, the most appealing bits were. So any way to make that character more comedic, I was given an opportunity. Nice to meet you, I'm Handsome Rob. And you are? Uh... Oh, my name's, my name's Becky, but it's written on my shirt. Listen, I'm gonna need your shirt and your truck. Perfect, I'll give them both to you. Would you, would you like my virginity as well? If it's on the menu. Oh, James, oh. I'm so glad I ran into you. Here, come to my party. The first annual king and queen of downtown pageant. I'd rather suck on a urinal cake. James, you have to come. You're my best friend. How can I be your best friend when I don't even like you? I had a meeting with Randy Barbado and Fenton Bailey who had uh, made the documentary about the club kids in the early 90s that they were translating into a feature. They told me they were interested in me playing James St. James and sent me home with James' book, Disco Bloodbath, and with the documentary about the club scene. And when I saw who James was, I was in shock that they would give me this opportunity, that they looked at me and saw the potential to play this character and I, only wanted to make them never regret that choice. So I put everything I had into giving an honest portrayal of James that was not a parody, that was not a novelty, that was not some kind of sensationalized caricature. James has such a unique voice and personality that I wanted to do justice to it. He's an incredibly impressive, incredibly talented individual. The filmmakers had hundreds of hours of these actual people in those actual moments that Mac and I attempted to recreate, but we really didn't want to just imitate it, imitate it. We wanted to feel like we were being them. And so we watched hundreds of hours of footage and just practiced letting the body movements, the speech patterns and the, the vocal tone feel organic. We had about two years of developing the script and finding financing before we actually shot. And then we shot the whole thing in about 14 days. Uh, so it was very fast um, and one of the hardest things I've had to do. But also one of the things I'm most proud of, even though so few people have seen it. You know, Michael, if it really was self-defense, then you've got nothing to worry about. You could, you should just turn yourself in. What's up, dude? What's up? Hey, you, uh, you here for that thing at Body English tonight? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, me too. It should be fun. I brought my whole crew out. Definitely. Hey, you know where I go with my agent? Never bad. Big fan. <laughs> That's funny, dude. That piggy bought me a house in Malibu. I had just done Italian Job with Mark Wahlberg, and he was developing this show for HBO and was asking any celebrity friends that he had to come and do cameos on it. And so they brought me on for one little bit, like pick a fight with Kevin on the roof of the standard. And while I was there, Doug Ellen and I were talking about what was the funniest about this interaction and why Seth Green would have a problem with E. Doug was like, I'd love there to be this confusion about whether or not you slept with E's girlfriend. I was like, oh, well, this is very funny. We wrote this whole backstory that to me was very funny where I'd been on like youth group teen tours with uh, Sloan Emmanuel Shariki, loved her or had tried to date her. And maybe we even had some drunken something, but now she's dating this guy who I have zero respect for. He's dating the girl that I love deep in my heart. Like, I'm gonna go out of my way to destroy this person. And then they just kept repeating it. Like, I, I, I didn't, I don't think I realized how often, even when I didn't appear in an episode, they were talking about Seth Green 
as the villain, as like the, the enemy of the good guys on the show. What I didn't anticipate was people being convinced that this was the truth. And the mistake that I made was playing a character called Seth Green and not playing a character called like um, Joe Smoke Show, I don't know. I think because that show was so popular, and I like to think because my performance was so convincing, it gave an entire generation bad information about me behind the scenes. It was so convincing that my, that Matt Senreich's wife, who had already known me for eight years, watched that show, and we I, I've been to their wedding. She said, gosh, is Seth really a jerk? <laughs> so how slow, man? She's still good, Seth. You're just letting him hit you, okay? You wanna avoid that as much as possible, okay? Cause he's hitting you really hard, and there's only so much you can take before you actually die, all right? So main takeaway, don't get hit. Okay. Hey, are we fighting like for real? I hear you. Oh shit. But when I set out to make Changeland, I knew a lot of things up front. Uh, making a movie is incredibly complicated and very difficult. And that if I was taking it on as a director, as well as an actor, that I needed conditions to be optimal in every direction. And part of that is making sure that you've got very strong producers, um, that you can control as much of the environment as you can, or that you've done a ton of work in advance to make sure that your conditions are just, just so. And because of some of the places where I was choosing to shoot on the edge of a cliff in the middle of the Indian Ocean, that it was going to be challenging for the production to even get there, let alone shoot several takes. So I needed actors that I could depend on who would immediately be convincing to the audience, would do all of their work in advance so that by the time, and, and also who had a comfort and a chemistry with me that we could just get it. And so that's what I did. I cast people that I knew were uh, excellent, competent uh, performers who were professional and uh, did a tremendous amount of work in advance. And then also I know that Brecken and I have great chemistry on camera. And so selfishly as an actor, I wanted another actor that I would be able to interact with because at the center of this movie is this friendship. And if you don't buy this friendship, if you don't care about these people, then you won't care about any of the things that they're trying to overcome. And I wanted to tell a real simple story about life and growing up and starting over and being scared, um, making a lot of bad decisions, but also, you know, especially in a time where um, a culture of toxic masculinity is, is being observed and derided and hopefully addressed and improved, I wanted to show a healthy relationship between two men who were not outward villains. I'm glad to be at a new school after they turned my old one into a for-profit prison. Hello? I'm looking for a surrogate father figure, but I'll settle for textbooks. Yeah, Robot Chicken is a strange one because it was not an intentional pursuit. I've spent, you know, over 20 years as an on-camera performer and had gotten a little bored with doing uh, chat shows. And so I knew that I was supposed to go on Conan and I wanted to make something. I had seen that Conan O'Brien uh, had a action figure made of him as a promotion. And I knew that I had a toy coming out from Austin Powers. And I thought, well, maybe there's some kind of stop motion adventure that our toys could go on. And so I got my friend, Matt Senreich, who at the time was the editorial director for Wizard Publications to help me figure out how to make um, this short. And while we were trying to find an animation house that would help us produce it, we got approached by Sony which was developing a precursor to YouTube called Screen Blast. So they got people like us and people like Fred Armisen to produce a series of shorts for the Wild Wild West web. We produced about 45 minutes and the whole thing spectacularly failed. But I made a deal with one of the lawyers to shop the content around. We were in the midst of making a deal with Comedy Central when September 11th happened. And it was about a year before anybody would consider making comedy. Just some, some coincidental timing. Uh, Family Guy had been off the air on Fox for a couple of years, and Seth MacFarlane called me and told me that there was a new division of Cartoon Network, which I'd already pitched, called the Adult Swim, and that these guys might be worth pitching to. They took a risk and gave us 20 quarter hours to produce, 
And at that point, Matt Senreich and I had to figure out how do we make television? We set about just doing it, not thinking that it was gonna go more than these 20 quarter hours, never thinking that it was gonna go beyond that short that I eventually brought on Conan O'Brien. We didn't intend to make a program. We were just kind of making something that made us laugh, something that was what we thought for a very small audience. Because at the time, Comic-Con or pop at that level, especially all this genre, superhero, reflective 80s nostalgia pop, like none of that was mainstream. It remains shocking to me that we've been doing this for 15 years. It's, that's, that's really weird. I, and the, the best way I can equate it to anybody is imagine you put on a play in your basement for your grandparents and then you won a Tony. I love making stuff. And so that's really what I'm gonna try and do for the rest of my life. I intend to do this until I physically can't anymore. So whether that's performing or directing or producing or writing, I am incredibly grateful to continue to have the opportunity to um, express myself and put it out there. Well, thanks Vanity Fair. This was a lengthy journey. We could probably all use a resoling of our shoes. Having walked through the timeline of my career up to this point, um, hopefully we'll be doing the same thing in another 10 or 20 years.